Hello everyone, my name is Miguel Myers. Welcome to My Horror Confessional, where every week I'll have a guest come on and talk about one classic horror movie that they haven't seen and why. We'll discuss the movie, the actors, and probably get off topic quite a bit. Once I believe that they have properly atoned, I will absolve them of their horror movie sin. Today we have returning three-time uh, show guest Zach Chapman. Fourth? Fourth time? Fourth I think time. it's four. Fourth time, okay. Fourth time. Yeah, and I can name all of them too, homie. Go for it's it. It's Friday me... the 13th, Leprechaun, and Zombie. Yeah, okay. So wait, so this is fifth. Yeah, this is your fifth time on. If we're doing... I named three just <laughs> oh, now, homie. Shit, I wasn't paying attention. Well, maybe it is the fifth time because I think there's one that I'm forgetting. All right, I was I wasn't paying attention. We're already off top. <laughs> also, you said every week. I feel like that's a lie. <laughs> that that yeah. <laughs> uh, well, for the except for the last six months, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if you listened to last week's episode with Anthony Jerome M. Uh, or if you haven't, the, the, we're doing a different uh, format. We're just updating the format. Uh, we're not going scene by scene. Um, just don't have the time to do that with changes in my life and all that. So we are just going to be talking about the movie and the shit we liked about it and and go from there. So still working out the kinks. So, um, Zach, you've been on the show a couple times, but since the last time you came on, I believe you were just about to launch... Or you had you haven't even launched yet the Kickstarter for for your comic, um, is that correct? I'm not sure the timing, but okay. yeah, I mean, since I'm, at I'm, some point we've talked. Yeah, I remember we've we talked about it. Um, yeah, pre-launch, I believe. So, if you could just let everybody know the comic book and the Kickstarter and, and what happened. Yeah, the Kickstarter did well. It uh, got probably over 200 percent of uh the funding goal and oh, yeah. i shipped out all the orders everyone has their books as people are liking it people are loving it i'm getting good feedback and if you want to buy it uh hit me up on twitter the link is in my bio on twitter and on instagram i'm at chappy zach and uh yeah it's just horror comics Miguel and I co-wrote one, and we're actually, we started two weekends ago, we started co-writing another one that's a sequel story, kind of a sequel story, uh, to the one that we wrote uh, that's in House of Blood. And it's the longest comic in House of Blood. It's 14 pages, and it's about a haunted rental. Um, but uh, but yeah, uh, it's really good. Uh, House of Blood, I, I mean, I at least can brag about the art. The art is amazing um yeah and it's, I, yeah it's a it's a great um anthology you got how many stories in there uh 13 i 13, think it's 15 if you include a couple of like these the little interstitials or whatever like the one pagers yeah yeah it's just like a, a, a classic throwback both an update to like ec comics um it's so it's so good it was so much fun working on it with you and you've actually had like a lot of positive like reviews or positive um feedback like especially this past year we, we did ghoulish book fest and you and i were we tabled together with with uh our other friend andrew hilbert and just like just like selling that to people they're so interested in in what you what you're selling um that it's just a lot of fun like the the horror stuff that's going in i mean i love the the one that we wrote together haunted rental uh it's so great um, but you've also been working uh, on other projects other comic projects right yeah i have a book that's supposed to be coming out uh it's a comic book so the issue one will be it's supposed to come out in october of this year but the publishers being like not super responsive to my emails so i don't fucking know but it's called a haunting on mars the publisher is scout comics uh you should be able to pre-order it at your local comic shop if you're like a comics fan um, it should be distributed everywhere. And then sometime uh, next year, uh, probably like U2 of next year for the trade, which I am super excited about. It's I worked on that book for like two and a half years, basically. I mean, basically the same, same amount of time uh, as House of Blood, but it took longer. Well, 
it's taking longer to publish because I'm trying to do it traditionally. So we have a deal with the publisher and they're distributing it. So I don't have to deal with all of that. So that's a relief, but. Okay. And what's it about? Oh, it's about, uh, it's kind of like if Shirley Jackson and uh, William Gibson uh, combined their powers and wrote a book together is like kind of my take on it. It's, it's a ghost story, but it's also a cyberpunk story. Like, science fiction story set on mars uh and i'll just kind of leave it at that like you have the the tropes of what you would normally have in a a haunted a traditional haunted house which is like you know you have the drunk and you have the the billionaire and you have like the uh the medium and the scientist and so i have all of i have like a science fiction version or a cyberpunk version of each of those characters and they all have a role to play. It's not like a simple, like, they just go in there and get scared. It's like everyone has, you know, it's because there's kind of like a secret Hitler aspect to it. So where it's like, who's the bad guy? That kind of thing. And for people who don't know, secret Hitler is a tabletop game where you yell at your friends. <laughs> he's not yeah. He's not idolizing Hitler or anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I brought that up uh, to some people in New York, and they were like, what are you talking about? And I was like, oh, it's just a board game. Like, it's a very popular board game where I'm from. But yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you, uh, how about uh, volume two of uh, House of Blood? Volume two for volume House two. of Blood? Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking. I'm you thinking got all these year. projects up in the air. Yeah. A lot of stuff up in the air. Uh, but chipping away at, house of blood volume two i have one story done and then i have two stories where the art is being worked on and then you and i are writing a fourth story uh and that's basically that would just be enough for probably one issue so uh (laughs) gonna need a lot more stories to fill that out yeah do you feel comfortable talking about spell slinger uh i mean yeah i might as well so yes yeah, spell slinger is a thing that i've been working on for longer than anything else i remember uh, spell slinger i told you who the, i've introduced you to an artist or i had a artist draw me something an invincible e from invincible and you were at my house and you liked the art and you reach out to him and that was like within the first couple months of us knowing each other i believe yeah so it was like 2017 yeah, he's been working on it since 2017, uh, but we're going to try to get that published and printed, kickstarted this year. So um, I just have a couple of things that I need him to do. I need him to do a cover, like the cover for the book. He's done like, we were going to do issues, but this, there's like one issue that's straight up 40 pages. So th- it, that doesn't really work in, like, that was the first comic the first real comic that i like sat down to write and i didn't realize that there there are things that you can and can't do in comic book publishing and can't really do a 40 issue comic it doesn't like it's not the proper length um so we're i'm gonna make it into a graphic novel and they're just gonna be really long chapters essentially uh so it's it's gonna be a huge book like over for a graphic novel it's probably around over 150 pages with all of the art and the extras and all that stuff it's gonna be really thick thicker than the average you know what i'm saying uh but yeah (laughs) and we're gonna have like extra supplemental stuff in the back there's gonna be like a bonus short story that's like a pro story and then i think i'm gonna uh, have like a little um campaign that people can play in the back too uh that's cool What, what do you mean by that so like It'll be like a little treatment that uh, my friend Pablo's said he'd be interested in in uh, working on with me, and it'll be like a one or two pager thing that people can like build characters and play in uh, the spell slinger world. But all oh, this awesome. is like kind of I I mean I have all of the it's in a weird like rights situation. I own all the rights, but uh, like I had optioned it and there's like some weird 
ness with uh the tv and film people which they don't own any rights to but uh so i basically i'm just kind of gonna give them a heads up i haven't done that yet Mm -hmm. but before i launch i'm gonna give them like two weeks and be like how do you want to be credited on this because they did do some editing yeah Uh, so that's kind of like one of the orders of business too that i still have pending that i'm like "Eh." not it's not a fun thing to do but it's a thing that's got to be done i remember you were so excited for that story and then it just got bogged down just got it just got bogged down and then that but that wasn't that what was like prompted you to start your own shit with like house of blood because you got tired of just how slow everything else was going. Yeah. I think it's a good example of like how people in TV and film don't understand comics. They don't, and and they don't know how to write comics and they, you know, they want to do things like directing And they want to like start calling shots and they want to have like all these edits and that kind of thing where it's like not really something. I mean, you, yeah, you have edits in comics, but like having art edits where it's like change the, like move these two pixels over here and move this guy's like arm a little bit over here and that kind of thing. It's like, just let the artist do what the artist is going to do. You know, yeah. Um, so I'm like, I think you can just get completely lost in like these edits that don't really have any kind of impact on the like quality of the story. They just are edits for having edits, and I've just needed to get out of that situation. So <laughs> yeah, I'm cool. I'm basically like, it's a kind of going to be a divorce thing i haven't spoken to them in over a year and they pay for all this art that i technically own um hey man yeah yeah do what you gotta do um yeah so that so what is the project that you're most excited about and is it in the horror genre because i, I well, know for, that you I'm, for for now it's a haunting on mars because that has a it's fully done it's five issues it's going to come out whenever the publisher releases it. I mean, I'm going to delays like, happen all the time in the comics. Yeah. Right? Um, definitely a haunting on Mars. Cause it'll be out next year. And you just want to see yourself in the, in a comic book shop. Right. Yeah. Well, that's I the, mean, house of blood sells really well. Yeah, in, that's true. At, in yeah. comic shops. So. Yeah. But like in diamond distributed, is yeah, it going to be distributed exactly. by diamond? Like in, can you say the name of the publisher or no? You, you don't want to say. Yeah, I said Scout. Okay, is Scout, Scout distributed by Diamond? Uh, they might be. Um, Diamond, they I know they were, but now everyone's kind of moving away from Diamond. Not a lot of people are distributed by Diamond anymore. Is it DC or does DC do their own thing? I forgot what happened there. Uh, I think DC does their own distribution and Marvel is distru- distributed by uh Simon and Simon and Schuster I think. Okay. All right. So it's a different ball game now. Diamond's like they had a monopoly and then a covid happened and it broke one contract and then it was like a cascade of when the DC contract broke then it was just all hell broke loose and everyone just left Diamond. They were just waiting for that shit, huh? Yeah, they they were. It, I mean, it was a long time coming because it was like such a monopoly for so long that now it's like, oh, okay, we can get cheaper distribution. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So, um, the reason why we're here uh, is to talk about a movie that you haven't seen. Is that correct? That you you hadn't seen. So you're here to confess your sin of never having watched Audition. That's correct. So you have a kind of a love-hate relationship with Japanese cinema, I think. Right? Because you love manga. I don't love manga. I what? like you don't some love manga? manga. Okay. I'm not calling you a weeaboo. I'm not saying you're you're, you're reading Ace Attorney or whatever, whatever the fuck. You do like manga. You just that's a like, video game, by the way. I've seen. I've seen, oh wait, maybe Ace Attorney. I think 
it's a movie as well. Okay, whatever. See, I don't even know <laughs> what to say. Power, no, Power Pop Girls isn't. No, I'm. Uh, I, I. I. The reason I say that is because I don't. I wouldn't just buy regular manga. I like specific manga. I like this fucking guy, Junji Ito. I like uh, oh, people you, who influence Junji well? Ito, and I like. Like a uh, Kazo Umez, his stuff is weird. Um, they do and... drifting classroom. Yeah, he did the drifting classroom. He has an even better series called Orochi or Orochi. Um, and he did that movie that you recommended, the Silver Haired Witch or something yes. like that. Yeah, yeah, that's so fucking good. That's a great movie. Um, and he did the manga that that was based off of. It's like the snake woman and the silver haired witch or something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so what is it? What what is the difference between like I know it, but for the audience, or I'd like to know what you think, what the difference is between like American horror comics and Japanese horror comics. Or American horror comics and Japanese manga. Japanese um, horror manga. Jesus. Yeah, that's a good well, that's a good question. So um it just depends on the time. Like now you can kind of find whatever in American comics, but you know, prior to the nineties or really probably the 20 teens, anything that was horror, like in America was going to be serialized or it was, or sorry, it was going to be like episodic anthology, not serialized. It's just going to be like one and done little short stories which is cool and I love that, but uh like horror manga, they're like these epic week after week stories that are that could be you know fifty chapters long. Like Uzumaki is a very long it is a little episodic, but it is a it's an epic series with you know several characters that are recurring that are kind of main characters, it takes place in a single town. Um, and, and they did it. So he, he did it, and it was serialized in a magazine over a period of years, right? It didn't come out like all at once. Yeah, exactly. So, so you can see, like, kind of like the evolution of his art a bit, also like the evolution of his storytelling. And there's even some stuff in a story that doesn't quite jive with what happened three or four chapters before. You know, it's some, he, like you're like, wait, that's not what what happened, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Because yeah, exactly. It, it doesn't matter because you're just you're into you're into both. You're into it being episodic and also it being like a serialized longer story. And then there's another one called PTSD Radio that's really good. That's that's like that. It reads much faster, but it's a ton of uh, chapters, too. So these these are more like longer form stories versus you know what in america you would never have anything like that until more recently um you'd never have anything that was horror and long series you might have some, like there was some stuff like that with marvel but it wasn't it didn't push horror because it was in you know marvel's horror stuff so it was Kind of horror, but also like just kind of superhero e or like monthly Marvel stuff. Still cool, like, um, but yeah. Anyways, that's well, yeah, and also like the the horror that's in Japanese and and tying this back to audition, the horror that's in Japanese manga is can be really body horrorish, like bodily yeah. horror, and especially like Junji Ito, like. Um, Uzumaki with spirals and all that sort of shit. It can get really, really crazy. Whereas in American horror, a lot of times it's it kind of follows the movie slashers or Draculas or zombies, some something like that. Whereas in in Japanese uh, manga, it's like yokai, right? Yeah, yokai or bodily horror, something like that. So, but that ties back to this movie that we are going to be talking about today. Uh, audition from 1989 directed by uh, Takashi Miike 
And I just want to say right now, I'm going to try to do all the uh, um, pronunciation. I can't even pronounce the word pronunciations correctly, but I might fuck, uh, fuck some up. So forgive me if I do. Uh, but so what is your history with this movie, Zach, with Audition? So I know you haven't seen it. Is there a particular reason you haven't seen it? Spoiler alert, we will be talking intense spoilers about the movie. So if you haven't seen it, uh, probably should watch it. Or if you don't care, that's cool, too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I heard that it was like really intense. Um, and I heard that it was like kind of borderline torture porn, uh, which I wouldn't categorize this movie as that. Uh, I think it has parts of that, but I don't think it is. I don't think it's like unbearably intense. I think it has intense parts, but like for some people it could be really intense like people were walking out of the premieres and throwing up and all that shit so i think you and i have a difference yeah well i I think also that i had it in my head that we're waiting for it basically since this movie came out like it was one of those things you see the cover and you know it's gonna be you know that there's gonna be torture in it and I'd heard from like roommates and stuff that it was like, oh shit, like that movie's hardcore. I don't want to watch that movie ever again or whatever. That's like a real sicko movie. And so when we talk about like the concept of this show, it's like, I felt like it's understandable why I hadn't seen this movie and why people would avoid seeing it because it has this reputation of being like one of the most intense movies. It's, it, it is have in my head had this reputation at, as being of the highest tier of intensities in movies that you could watch and so i was like all right well i want to push myself i want to like experience that like i'm going to see what the you know what the hype is uh, around it um you know i i was like i'm gonna get i'm gonna it's gonna be intense and i'm gonna be grossed out by it but um you know you'll be there for me and we'll watch it together uh, which we, which but then we it didn't did. end up being as crazy as i think maybe if i had seen it when i was a teenager i think this would have been like oh my god i can't handle this but you know I, after watching like all the stuff that we watch it's just like oh it's just another scene where someone do get you know bad shit happens to some dude he gets his, his head his uh foot cut off okay i've seen that before <laughs> So, yeah, I think we've been desensitized, but yeah, yeah, this is definitely uh, very intense, but it's, it's a slow burn that I think pays off uh, tremendously because uh, you and I were watching it and um, you were like, what the fuck is happening, right? Like, it feels for a long time like a romantic drama sort of thing, right? Uh, and then you're kind of waiting for, but, but then we get uh, some great scenes. Let me, let me go into the real quick about the movie and then we can get going talking about it. So um, the cast, we have the character Asami Yamazaki um, and, and that's, and she's played by Aihi Shina. Uh, we have Shiga. Oh, sorry. So Asami is the prote- antagonist, right? Yeah. She's antagonist. Uh, then we have Shigaharu Ayama, who is played by Ryu Ishibashi, and he's the main guy. And, and I'm going to go over, you know, the the plot of it real quick. Uh, then we have Yasuhisa Yoshikawa, played by Jun Kunimura, and he's the main guy's friend. He is Shigaharu's friend. And then we have Shigehiko Ayama. And that's he's played by Tetsu Sawaki, and that's the main guy's son. That is Shigaharu's son. And then we have uh, the old man in the wheelchair, and that's he's played by Renji Ishibashi. And um, so that's kind of like the, there's a bunch of other people, but really those are kind of like the, the main core group of people. So Shigaharu Ayama is a widower whose son Shigehiko says that he uh, he should find a new wife. Shigeharu's friend Yasuhisa Yoshikawa is a film producer, and he devises a mock casting audition at which young women audition for the parts, quote unquote, of Shigeharu's new wife. So this right here, this premise is fucked. It's 
such a shithead thing to do. Yeah. This is such a 1999, like male chauvinist thing. Um, and I was going to say like, you would only see this in J- Japan because Japan is known to be very uh, chauvinist um, society. But then I'm like, yeah, so is America. You could see that anywhere in the world, really. Um, what did you think of the, this concept of, you know, holding uh, an audition? I, I thought that it was treated with, I liked how it was treated. Cause I feel like if they, um, if they remake this movie, they're going to hang a bunch of lanterns on how shitty what he's doing is. And they're going to do it immediately because audiences are just not going to, you know, they're going to be scared of how audiences would react to uh, your main character being skeezy like that. But Mm -hmm. this movie because it starts off with his wife dying and then the next scene is like his son basically telling him you need a wife. It's like 10 years later or eight years later or something. Yeah. Eight years later. And then, then it's his boss telling him, Oh, you need, you should do this. You, you see how he kind of falls into it in a way that's a little empathy. It's not overly empathetic. Like, it's not making him a hero in any way, but it's also not like, look at how shitty this is. Let's go. Let's torture this guy. Like, it's it's playing it really well, I think. Like, it's it's not preaching at all. But then there is a payoff for what he's doing in the end, you know? Right. Well, it was, you know, directed by a man, written by two men so i I think i I get what you're saying but but i i the reason why i think that is is because they may think that this was okay i i I, nowhere 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 in the movie do they make it even seem that it's not okay i mean he does get his leg that is true right yeah and she does she does say I was just like one of the women that you auditioned in this okay. space, you know? So that's there that is. is, so that's why I like it is like that is in there, but it's not overt. And it's, it's very way towards the end. Like it, I see what you're saying. And I do think, I do think that they were empathizing too much with this character, but what it makes is something that is not preachy in any way, which is, kind of it's like yeah we know this is terrible we don't need to be told that but i think a modern movie would just not have the stomach to get as far into the film as it does before it becomes a fucking teachable moment for this guy (laughs) Um, teachable moment teachable moment (laughs) (laughs) interesting way to put it uh, yeah, so the writers of the movie were Ryu Murakami and Daisuke Tengen, and Ryu was the uh, writer of the novel. So this movie was um, not transitions. What is it called? Um, it was a book, and it was turned into a, a movie. So um, yeah, so then back to the mo- uh, back to the plot. Uh, Shigeharu agrees to the plan and is immediately enchanted. Uh, so they have the whole uh, audition. And he reads in a uh oh she wrote an essay essay right about being about uh being injured, you know, being a professional ballet dancer and then being injured, you know, right when she was 18, I guess maybe about to become a professional ballet dancer or whatever. It ruined her career and it felt like she was dying or whatever. And he's moved by this. And then also he's like super attracted to her. So there's like thousands of women and they narrow it down and then he's like basically he starts dating her you know using with you know the all this pretense is just to date her you know he's the writer of the movie or he's like a producer on the movie and he invites her out and then they they start quickly start dating Um, yeah and one thing that i i after researching the movie i noticed or I realized that she's always in white 
And it's kind of contrary to what we have here in, in the United States or even other parts of the world where when you're in mourning or just in general, when you wear black, it's like a sign of like, it's some, like a mourning or evil intent or something like that. Whereas in Japan, wearing white is is uh, connected to death. That's right. So black is connected to death here in, in America and in other parts of the world. And in Japan, white is the color white is connected to death. And so she's in the movie the whole time wearing white. And so that's kind of like a, a, a hint for us. But um, he's enchanted by Asami Yamazaki and he's attracted to her apparent emotional depth. So Yasuhisa cannot reach any of the references in Asami's resume, such as a music producer she said she worked for who was missing. However, Shigeharu is so enthralled by her that he pursues her anyway. She lives in an empty apartment containing a sack and a phone. For four days after the audition, she, she sits perfectly still next to the phone, waiting for it to ring. This and, was so fucking creepy. And this is this is probably almost the halfway point of the movie where you see that sack. So that's yeah, it's, why it's, I it's, would it's, say it's this is a slow. Yeah. Because there's no, there's not really any hint of horror until that sack and you see her the way she sits is like so bizarre um and like that i think is repeated throughout the rest of the movie because it becomes more and more surreal to where like you kind of don't know what's happening and i think that's like one of the things that I really like about the movie is trying to understand, like, is this real or is he hallucinating? Um, but yeah, that that sack is like the first bit of like, oh, OK, this is this is a horror movie. It's not, you know, some drama. It's not a crime thing. It's a horror movie. There's a there is something in that basket and then it moves. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what it is. And the thing is, like the way she's sitting, like. She's slouched on the floor and her whole body is, is like slouched down. And you can see like bones popping up because she is so skinny um, and it just looks creepy. And then she's just staring at the phone. And we were, t- we were talking about the composition of the shots. Like they're incredible for, for a movie by Takeshi, uh, Takashi Miike, who is known, he's a, he's like a, you'd call a journeyman here. Like he just, uh, at, at that time, especially, it was at the beginning of his career, he was just cranking out movies, like three or four movies on average a year, you know, like he uh, he was on a press tour for another movie when this movie came out and people were telling him that, you know, people were throwing up in the theaters and, and leaving and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and he's like, oh, that, I'm glad that he liked it, but he's already on to something else. And that's the way he's been his whole career. But so to to. You know, I'm thinking about this shot right here where she's like, she's in the foreground, the sack is in the background, uh, and in the middle kind of like is the phone, and she's just kind of staring at it. And it kind of reminds you of, um, shoot, what's the name from Ring, Ringu? Uh, what's her name? Um, yeah. Um, no, it's Mars from there. Sako or something. Sadako, like. Sadako, yeah, yeah. Because her hair is in front of her face. And then when the phone rings, you just get an upturned smile. And she's like, yeah. I got him. And you could tell that like, she's obviously she's done it before at this point. You don't know. Right. Because you, if it's the first time you're seeing, you don't know what's in the sack when it moves or whatever, but you have an inkling. And then when she smiles, you're like, fuck, this guy is, doesn't know who the, who he just fucked with. Yeah. It's crazy. And that you're right. That's when I was like, this is now, you know, for a fact that you're in a horror movie. I, and I, but I do think, like you were saying, the the shots before that, you know, it's not like s- some of the pacing isn't super compelling bef- before that. But what is compelling is like the the composition a lot of a lot of the shots are just like randomly interesting. Like it's like he, what he's filming, is a little bit mundane. Like mm-hmm. people talking in an office. Or, you know, uh, people on a date or people drinking a beer or uh, people interviewing other people. But the way it's shot, the composition of the shot is pretty interesting. It is like very like he 
he's balancing it out in a way that's like really pleasing to look. So it kind of gets a pass on like, all right, this stuff's not super, super interesting. It's moving the plot along, but at least it's moving a lot, the plot along in like a visually like pretty way. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you get that like stinger of like the body or, I mean, it's just a bag at that point. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's something in the bag that's moving. So you, (laughs) I mean, what else could it be? It's body sized. It could be an animal, like you don't know, right? Yeah. So when if when the phone finally rings, she answers, pretending that she never expected Shigaharu to call. After several dates, she agrees to accompany him to a seaside hotel, where Shigaharu intends to propose marriage. Um, at the hotel, Asami reveals burn scars on her body. Before having sex, Asami demands that Shigaharu pledge his love to her. And this is very important. And no one else. And this line comes back at the end of the movie. So deeply moved by this, Shigaharu agrees. And then in the morning, Asami is nowhere to be found. And I mean, this deeply was, this moved. I, I don't know about deep, like, is it a very awkward sex scene? Because she, it's... she undresses all the way. And then he is just like staring at her. And like, above the bed just looking down at her very yeah like we're like what it's really doing? uncomfortable for and, and it goes like, on forever and he's, and he's also like 20 years older than her like there's that whole age gap right so yeah like he's pretty he's pretty old and she's pretty young um but yeah there, it is really uncomfortable i don't know well i guess his wife's been dead, dead for 10 years he hasn't been with another woman since i i'm sure it'd be uncomfortable but yeah i, I see what you're saying it was it was weird for sure um, but and then before this, also, there's a time where they're in a car. This shot, like, is one of the things that stays with me in this movie, is they're in a, they're in a taxi in the back seat, and you even mentioned something about it, like because we watched it together. He, they drop her off, and on the side of a road, right? And she's maybe they're close to home or whatever, and the the taxi keeps driving and we see her out of the back window and she's just staring still like at, at the car as it drives away. She doesn't make any move to go to the sidewalk or anything like that. She's just staring straight ahead at the car as it leaves. And that, that was really intense and creepy for me. That was one of the creepier scenes that I remember seeing in the last, in the last, you know, in, in a long while. You know, and it was something very small. And if you blink or if you weren't paying paying attention, you would have missed it. And I just yeah, because the focus, the focus of that shot is his reaction and the car driving away, and she's just basically in the background, just standing there, (laughs) waiting for that car to just get the fuck out of there. Because for him, it's like the end of a cute date, right? And he's like in love with this woman, and like she is like, as soon as she exits the car, she breaks character and she's not the asami that uh shigaharu knows like he she is like that cold-blooded killer that we're gonna we're gonna see coming up in the future you know this is a great shot i just love that yeah so um Um, yeah so so she um when he wakes up she's gone like all the way gone he goes to his boss he's trying to find where she is he calls, he can't find her. Uh, his boss, who has her like resume, her CV or whatever, the address, the phone number, none of that stuff's working. And eventually he goes to her like ballet place, her like where she grew up or the ball- the place where she learned to Dance be to. a dancer. And there's someone who's maybe experiencing homelessness. I don't know. Uh, but he is playing piano and he has, uh, these bizarre fake legs and he's in a a wheelchair and he's laughing and, uh, he's a very creepy guy. And when asked about, uh, her, he, he asks the main character if, I think he slept with her or if he's had her and then uh, he just starts laughing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Like he's really, 
he's playing the piano. He's in a wheelchair. He like wheels up to, to Shigeharu. And yeah, he just starts asking him questions like how he knows her. And you, you could tell like something's not right here because he's got those prosthetic feet that look fucked up, like real bad. Yeah. And uh, so something's happening. We're not quite sure what it is. Um, but so he went there to try to get information. He didn't really get anything. So then he goes to the bar where she said she worked at. She said she had a friend, I believe it was a female friend who let her work at a bar for like three times a week. So he goes and he tracks down that bar and, um, he, he finds that it's been abandoned for a year following the murder and dismemberment of the owner. And then a passerby tells Shigeharu that the police found after all was said and done and they they uh, collected all the the uh, bits and pieces of bodies said that they had three extra fingers an extra ear and an extra tongue when they recovered the body yeah so we're like holy shit and shigeharu he like he, the, the, this is a bit of like over dramatic because the guy the passerby was just there. He was just like matter of factly telling him this, but Shigeharu was like, Oh, and he like, well, and that's where it starts getting surreal because he has like a, he has a quick flash of seeing like a tongue flicking around and an ear flicking around in a puddle of blood on the ground. And that, and at that point when I saw that, I was like, Oh, this isn't going to be that intense of a movie. I mean, it is, but it's like the the way it's done is like kind of campy. Yeah, it's like campy for sure. it's a t- it's a tongue wiggling around in a thing of blood. It's like this is goofy, you know. Yeah. So it's like okay, this is and and also I think it's like it's shot in you know it was turn of the nineteen ninety nine, but it does look like it was shot a little bit prior to that. Something about the quality of it. Oh, there well, were... it, this was all of his movies were shot to go like straight to video. And then when, when a movie comes out where they believe it's a little bit higher quality than 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 what video should be, then they release it theatrically. But it's always shot to be on video. So, yeah, I, I believe that they didn't, uh, you know, use the the highest quality camera yeah. to shoot these right because he's just supposed to be quick because he turns them around so quickly two or three weeks at the max on yeah movie, that makes you know? sense so uh meanwhile asami goes to shigaharu's house and finds a photo of his late wife enraged she drugs his liquor so then shigaharu comes home pours a drink and after a short while he feels the effects of the drug and at this point, we are like three quarters of the way through the movie, I believe. Yeah. And at this point, the only thing that we've seen is like her 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 wicked smile, perhaps a body in the um in a bag, and then two people have been killed that we've been told about. Uh, we saw a, a hallucination of a tongue, but really nothing, nothing that would lead us to what for me, nothing that would lead us to what we're about to see. I don't like where you did you have any inkling of what I know that you said that you thought it was just going to be campy after the tongue. Well, I mean, I seen the I'd seen the cover. So I figured like, OK, something really, really bad is going to happen in the last, you know, quarter of this movie. But the other thing is it does a really good job. So as soon as he gets drugged, it becomes way more surreal. You start seeing things that maybe happened in the past and it includes like what she has done to somebody before you you don't see you see the outcome you see the person come out of the bag and they're they have their missing fingers and they have their missing tongue and and they're missing ear and stuff and they're missing feet looks too and that's the big thing that's like the okay, I feel like I know what's going to come for this guy because there's this person in a bag. She's probably going to kill this person. And then he's, I thought the ending was going to be, he's going to be the the person in the bag now. Like that's how it's going to end. She's going to cut him up and then scoop him up in a bag and she's going to be off. I think Um, that's exactly what she meant to do. If what happened didn't happen. I think that's where we would have been at. 
Yeah, um, and and that's the, the the grossest thing that happens in the movie is she what she feeds this guy because she's like you must love only me. So she like this is so disgusting, but she pukes in a dog bowl and that's what she feeds this little human person that she's like cut up who's still alive in this bag. Yes, that's so I just want to back up a second. How cuz he's there. Like we are in her house. Now, so he's been drugged. He fell on the floor. Like he's passed out or whatever. He's hallucinating this. But he's never been to her house. He doesn't know about the bag. How so how is he seeing this? Is that that's I what mean, I that's kind of what I love about this movie. It's like <laughs> it's so surreal like he's he's putting things together based off of the clues and then she says something uh when she's torturing him so i feel like time becomes disjointed when she's torturing him yeah and she's like pain pain will bring truth or whatever and so he's seeing like the truth of her past like what she's done to people just kind of based off that line i guess it's like maybe not mechanically like sound, but like literally it's like, okay, I I'm here for it. Like I'm buying that. Like he's either seeing it or like seeing a version of roughly what happened because it becomes so surreal. There are parts that definitely did not happen that he sees like he's during the scene, like it, it chops back and forth between him getting tortured by her and, um, him seeing like talking to her on a date and kind of putting these these little clues yeah. together yeah. about what happened to the other people that she's done this with and then one of those things that happens on that date is not a thing that ha- that we know it it couldn't have happened because it's like his wife and his son are like don't marry her or whatever yeah. anyone but her so they pop up in in one of these little like little vignettes stations. yeah but yeah, so you're right. So the uh, the man crawls out of the sack. He's begging for food. And in the background, we hear Asami. Like, we don't know what's happening. We just hear this noise, like this retching. And then uh, Shigahara moves, and she comes into view, and she's puking into this dog bowl. And it's green, and it's nasty. And she sets it down in front of this poor bastard in the sack. And he just devours it. Right, because he doesn't have a tongue, so yeah, he can't eat anything. This is it's gross. This it's is gross to up. even think about. Yeah, <laughs> it's. Can you imagine how warm it is? Oh god, it's pretty. Yeah, fucked up. it's one of the most <laughs> fucked up things. Like, now I know you're talking about you know perhaps this being torture porn. This predates like the invention of the term por- torture porn, and but uh, like Eli Roth actually uh took a lot of um inspiration from this movie and from Takashi Miike in general he's like one of his biggest fans he actually had Takashi Miike do a uh a cameo in Hostel Part 2 and so he's in there uh, as uh, you know he's acting in that movie so um so I don't quite think it's torture porn but it, it would be like proto torture porn or something right yeah but um, yeah, I mean this 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 scene right here is pretty fucking nasty. Um, but then Shigaharu collapse. Oh, sorry. Um, so Shigaharu has collapsed from the drug, and Asami injects him with a paralytic agent that leaves his nerves alert, but he's unable to move. And then she tortures him with the needles, and she's she's doing the kitty 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 kitty, which means like a little bit deeper. That's so fucking creepy. Just kick, 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 kick. <laughs> and this was actually um, not written in the script. This was uh, an idea that Aihi Shina, the actress who played Asami, she had, she was muttering this to herself while they're shooting. And Takeshi Miki asked her what she was doing. And she's like, oh, I'm just saying this to keep myself, you know, in scene or whatever while I'm doing this. He's like, yes, say that louder. And then that's what they became like the, I think pivotal, I don't know, thing that people remember from this movie. Like if you were to play that to somebody, they would know what the fuck you were talking about. Right. Oh yeah. Oh, I do want to shout out this, this scene in particular has really, it's 
it's strange because other scenes I would say have really bad um, audio design, but the the worst or the grossest parts of this movie, not the worst parts, but the grossest parts of this movie have really good audio design. And it's, it's like this wet, gross sound of the, the needles going into like the flesh and maybe like his organs or whatever. Cause she pushes them very deep into, <laughs> into yeah. him. And, and the sound is done really well. Be but also the reason I wouldn't say that this is torture porn is that it like the Texas chainsaw massacre. I mean, it does show some stuff. It does. It does show stuff, but it, it isn't uh, gratuitous in what it shows. I felt like it wasn't, super gratuitous um you know i i don't i'm not asking for more i'm definitely not asking for more but yeah. there are thing there are film techniques that it uses that trick you into thinking that it's grosser than it is like her like all she's doing right is like you see a scene of him and her she's on top of him and then it shoots to his pov and then she's pointing the needle into the pov of the camera and then you're getting those kind of gushy sounds. So if you just think of it like that, it's just really well shot. It's a good idea, but it's not like they're not using a ton of prosthetics and like using a ton of gore effects that you might think you saw. It's using a lot of smart camera work. There are parts like you do see her cut his foot off, but the needle parts for the most part of it is is done in a smart way like you don't see a needle go into his face um yeah. you see it in his face afterwards and you hear it go in but you don't see it so that's another thing where it's like it's doing he's doing smart sound design to just creep you out and then and smart pov shots yeah, so the the needle stuff it's it's uh, acupuncture. It looks like it's she's using yeah. acupuncture needles, but and long, really, really long, very long. Yeah, and she's put them in, like all over his face, uh, in his body, like, and then when he's she's got a bunch in his body, she like falls into him so that it goes even deeper, and you're like, oh fuck, and yeah. then she she does it where she does put it in his eyes, and that is so fucked up. Um, they, that wasn't actually a prosthetic. They so they placed that. Uh, and eyes and like bridge of the nose over the actors uh over shigaharu's face and so she's actually putting the needles into fake eyes it looks great it looks amazing um but this is what she, she tells him that just like everyone else in her life he has failed to love only her um she cannot tolerate his feelings for anyone else even his own son so like she warned him she asked him to only love her him uh, only love her and he didn't do it so um she then pulls out a it looks like a is it like a garret a garrett's is that what it's called yeah but it's like a razor garrot 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 yeah and we see that she used this prior she used it on the uh man in the wheelchair where she fucking decapitated his whole head with it so we yeah. know now that it can cut through skin and bone easily very easily and yeah. that as well i feel like that could have been really campy like cutting off a man's head but it wasn't campy it looked really yeah it yeah and you actually do see that so i mean it, maybe it is but like i mean it's not it's not something that is like so well done that you're like oh it makes me want to puke it is intense but it's like I don't know. You know, you hear these things and you're like, oh, I can't, you know, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not, I'm on, I'm going to have to look away. It, and I don't think there was anything in this movie that like you want to look away, but you can handle it. You know, I think it doesn't celebrate it. I think yeah. it, it's something that happens, but it's not celebrated and it's not, um, they don't hold the camera for long periods of time. In, in some points, even they just cut away. Um, yeah. They so do cut away a lot. Yeah, yeah, so I'm I'm gonna get to that point. So I just want to get through this part. So then she so she breaks out the the garage and she just like wraps it around his leg and just starts going at it, like going back and forth and back and forth. And that one shot that I was talking about was you know, the blood is kind of spurting on her. 
uh, they take the shot from inside to outside and you don't hear a lot of noise. I don't think you hear any noise, but you just see her stand out, you know, sitting by his feet, just doing this thing and blood is splattering onto the glass door. And we're seeing that from outside. I think it was composed brilliantly. I love that shot a lot. Well, and not only that, you're watching it and you're like, it goes from inside to outside of the house. And the thing is, there's a window there. Yeah. And you're like, oh, this shot is so well, like the cinematography on this shot is really good. But not only that, it has a payoff and it has like a punchline to that shot in that she throws the foot. So, th- so you, you see the rest of her cutting it off. You see her pick up the foot and she throws it and it hits the window. So yeah. it's like, it's really well, like the cinematography is great. And then there's a joke to it, you yeah. know? So it's like, or there's like not, there's a narrative punch to it. That's like, oh, we're not just shooting this beautifully. There's actually like a cute little reason to do it. And like blood splatters the window and the, the foot hits the window and blood splatters the window. It's just like, oh my God, that that is just brilliant. Like from a horror standpoint and from like a, like an artistic, like, you know, what do they call them? Like art house film. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's film like an art house film. And then it's like, oh yeah, here's a foot in your face. <laughs> so like the visual storytelling of the movie is great. Yeah. That, uh, thank you for summarizing that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, w- what I wanted to mention was that w- what we failed to mention was that throughout the movie, Asami is very demure and she's yeah. like, always looking down and she's not projecting her voice very much, very much like what a man, like, I don't even know how to say it. Like problematic. Probably we, we got them boys. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I know what you're saying. It's like what a certain kind of man like fantasizes as is like, oh, I just want this subservient woman that's going to stay at home all day and, uh, you know, whatever, cook me meals or whatever. And this movie is subversive in that really that's what she wants. She's she's catfishing men with like what she thinks they want which is that subservient woman that i'll just be really happy just just feed just have a home for me and feed me like this is a basically like part of the plot in that the director the fake director of it is like you just you want a woman who's just happy to be at home and to listen to cds and to cook you dinner he basically says that flat out yeah and like What's really funny is like, that's what she wants. She wants a man who just wants her literally so much that the only thing he has is her like no has no agency, has no ability to walk. So in in that way, this movie is very literary. It's like a foil to that. Like what what women, you know, what kind of woman like these men who want a subservient housewife want versus what they're getting catfished into, which is being a subservient body in a bag that is entirely dependent upon her love and throw up to survive. Literally. Yeah. So um, it was just great that she was, like you said, she was catfishing him. And then now she's like in her power and like, she's like 100% who she is always and um just like it's like one of those good for her movies <laughs> sort of you know and yeah you know. and so after he's after um uh, shigaharu has lost one leg she starts in on the other one but his son shigahiko returns home um and uh she sneaks up on him with with it looked like a can of mace but like the mace knocks him out so i don't think it was mace it was a can of some knockout gas. Right? Yeah. Like, is that what you took it as? Yeah, some kind of gas thing that knocks someone out. Yeah. And then as she's like chasing him around the house, Shigaharu like appears to wake up in the hotel just after he and Asami had sex. And his current ordeal seems to only be a nightmare. 
So what did you think when this happened here? Uh, well, I I was like, I hope it's not just going to be like, oh, and he woke up. But then, but then when it ended up not being it, I appreciated it for its surreal quality. Because you're just questioning, like, he's in so much pain. It's almost like the pain that he was in brought him back to the moment that got him in to that in the first place, which is like just he, the thing that he did that he couldn't come back from that triggered this was him sleeping with her in the hotel. And so it, it gets brought back to that moment. And it's like, is that, was that worth it? And, and then, but then you figure out, oh, okay, it's not like he wakes up and then everything's fine. It's like, he then he comes to and she's like it's like trying to sneak up on his son and his son ends up you know they get a, there's a chase throughout the house and his son manages to dodge the you know the sleeping gas or whatever and then ends up like doing a badass kick sending her flying down the staircase and then it just like breaks her uh like it, I think it's like a. It looks like it internally decapitated her, because you see like the blood. It's really gross. Like, like you see the blood squirting inside of her neck. It's so like gross, pulsing, but like it's it, pulsating. Well, you, I I mean like when someone gets, I think like when someone gets internally decapitated, like the blood comes out in their body, mm. and you see it like 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 squirting but like it doesn't leave their body it's like there's no been no laceration in, in the skin so it's got no yeah way. yeah that's what it looks like so you see that blood like pulsing and and then she's just lying there and then you don't know if it's like real or not but she's like look you know she looks over to like all paralyzed or whatever she looks over to the main character and the main character is like looking at her and you no know, he's got no feet basically yeah and she like she starts repeating what she said to him on one of their dates about her being so excited to see him again. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then the movie ends there. And like I just want to say real quick, the 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 son does like a donkey kick or something. Like he fully he kicks, kicks the her. shit out of her. She does not they're at the top of the stairs and she does not touch a single stair. <laughs> She goes from the top of the stair all the way down to the bottom of the stair. And yeah, she's like, I mean, he kicked her off two stories. She she had a two story fall because she didn't hit a single stair. Yeah, and like she's wayfish, like she's extremely skinny, like when and so like she's got no no padding. It's gonna something's gonna break. He, you, know? you know what he did? He dinosaur kicked her because that kid was obsessed with dinosaurs. Yeah. So and then so that's the end of the movie. Um, I mean, it was. Just, I, I don't know, man. It was a real fun movie to watch. And it's just like Takashi Miike and, and like Japanese cinema has a way, or I would even say like Asian cinema has a, a way of telling stories that are just so different from Western like cinema that it's just so exciting to watch. And it's, I don't know. It's like storytelling is first, I think, first and foremost, it feels like to me. And that's why this because this movie could have gone very bad. It could have gone very campy. It could have gone ultra, ultra like gore porn, like blood flying everywhere. It could have done that, but instead like they focused on the story and you had some of it in there, but they primarily focused on the story. And that's just something that I really appreciate. What do they call it? Story forward. Um, is that the pretentious term I'm looking for? Um, yeah. E- either way, it just, uh, just uh, really enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm, I think I like it for the same reasons in that you, you know, we watch all this Western stuff and you can just roughly, if it's not being super subversive, you know, 15 minutes in what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. So it just gets a little boring. So you're just trying to get to the parts that you like or get to the payoffs or, you know, um, but when you're watching uh, Japanese cinema or just foreign cinema in general, the foreign cinema that isn't 
paying o- homage to Western audiences or trying to lull in Western audiences, like foreign cinema for foreign cinema. Like it's not catering to us. That's really exciting because you don't know where what's going to happen next. You you might get a movie that half of it seems like uh, a a little bit of this skeezy like an erotic romance thriller. drama thriller, and then ends up being a straight balls to the wall surreal horror, uh, which is just not something that you'd get in America because we have to have our little like. You have to let them know that it's a horror movie within the first 10 minutes or you're going to lose some people. And it's like, I, I get both sides of it, but I really appreciate, you know, foreign horror films or just foreign films in general. Uh, but um, in speaking of, uh, about like Western audiences, like you were talking about, um, Mike has stated that he was not surprised that it was successful in the West but that he had no idea what goes on in the minds of people in the West. And he doesn't pretend to know what their tastes are. He says, I don't want to start thinking about that. It's nice that they liked my movie, but I'm not going to start deliberately worrying about why or what I can do to make it happen again. Perfect. And the actress, uh, Ehi Shina, who played uh, Asami, stated that in Japan, only a certain type of film fan would watch Audition. By comparison, she said the film was seen by many more people overseas, uh, which she attributed to good timing. So, yeah, like, like you were saying earlier, um, kind of the reason why you didn't watch it was because it, it had it was known as one of the like, a, you know, a terrible movie like a 2020 or, 20 teens video nasty almost. Yeah, like it's, yeah, it's yeah. too intense, you know. Yeah. So. This movie, I think, um, while we were watching it, I was telling you, it's like a slow burn. It's a slow burn approach to horror. It's yeah. gradually building tension and dread. Um, what do you think makes this pacing effective in creating a chilling atmosphere? Like, what do you think? Why do you think that this approach to storytelling is so effective? Well, it's less predictable. I'm not sure if I'm like that I actually love slow burns. Because I do, you know, I'm an ADD person and I like, but, th- but this movie was shot so well that it wasn't, it wasn't boring. You know, it wasn't like, I, I wasn't needing to, well, and you, you can't really reach for your phone when you're watching a foreign movie because you have to have your eyes on the, on the film. Yeah, Otherwise stay, you don't know, what's, the, you literally don't know what's going on. Stay out of the chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I do, you know, I, I do appreciate modern sensibilities just because i like to be entertained earlier in films too even if you're gonna like do even if you're gonna have this massive payoff at the end i do like little little bits of horror not jump scares you know not i'm not saying like you need to throw in a a cat at the screen or something but I am saying, like, I do appreciate that when movies do that, and they fi- when they figure out a way to put dread in earlier. That was a thing that a problem that I had with this movie. A lot of that you can fix with, like, A twenty four does this great. Now you just throw a fucking creepy ass score in at the beginning of the movie, and you have these slow shots, and the music builds this dread. Mm-hmm. And this movie just had no music, like that was any good. And I feel like that might be, it could be a, a taste thing. I think it might be an artifact of Takashi Miike filming like crazy and just trying to get through and just not having the time to dedicate to a score that's like punching you full of dread. But I think the only thing that could really make this movie any better would be to, to, to yeah, because you would silly this movie if you were putting in like scary moments earlier but if you put in like you know his wife is dying like that's sad but if you so if you kind of brought a more dreadful score earlier in the film i think that could have been good for it yeah i think um to what you're saying about the 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 score um and the sound design i think they're trying to contribute to like your sense of uneasiness or unease in the movie 
right? Yeah. It's like it's not formulaic. You know, like so there's a scene where there's some I think it might be when they're about to have sex or something like that. Um that scene begins and there's some music and it's really cheesy and you're kind of like, what the hell? But then also the sound design part, they're on a date and they're in the foreground and in the background is traffic. Do you remember that? And traffic, the, the sounds of traffic was like 50% what the sound of their, their dialogue was. And you're like, what the fuck is happening here? I couldn't, I, I couldn't decipher if that was purposeful. Like if that had some point to, like, is it, does it need to be detached? And could you have done that with some kind of drowning score that this thing that creeps up on you that gives the same effect, but doesn't seem unprofessional? Because to me, it, it was like, this seems kind of like unprofessional or like it, it was like made for TV and not made for like to be in the cinema. It was like if you and I went to a restaurant and filmed and we had yeah, no, that is what had, it sounded and like. We had yeah. no mics, right? Like we just, yeah. used, and it was just, but, but for me, it was just kind of off putting and, and like didn't have a sure footing of, of in the yeah. story. So, so I think while maybe it wasn't the most effective way, I, I think I kind of see what they were going for there, but yeah. Um. So another question I had for you is, uh, First of all, we didn't even talk about the iconic. So you're talking about the, the cover. You've seen the cover, so you knew something yeah. bad was going to happen. When she gets to his house, she she changes into this, basically, it's like a nurse's costume. And, but you know you're, you're in for some fuckery because she's got black leather gloves, like, all the way up to her, past her elbow. And... um. She... I mean, it's the whole Dexter outfit, right? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like it's the murder outfit. It's like, look, I'm gonna things are gonna get wet. I mean, she rolls him. She rolls him back. Puts the canvas sack on the floor, or whatever. Yeah, rolls him back on. Like she's done this, right? It's completely yeah. Dexter. You're absolutely correct. That's it's Dexter. Or Dexter is this because I think this came before Dexter, right? Yeah. Um, but th- that scene or that shot of her like looking back over her shoulder with the with the needle i think that's become an iconic scene or an iconic shot and i just love that we have this japanese actress this japanese character as like an iconic shot in horror right i I love that part of it but so the character of asami yamazaki she's often regarded as as one of the most memorable and disturbing villains in recent horror cinema so I was wondering what qualities or like traits to you make her like such a terrifying and like you such well, a terrifying I, antagonist. I think it's that demure like that switch. Yeah, it's like she is like it's that catfishing like oh look at how like defenseless I am. This like e- it's subverting who you think a murderer is because, you know, historically, this is not the type of person that's going to be a perpetrator of a murder, right? Yeah. Like that's historically and statistically v- extremely unlikely. And so she's serial killing as well. Yeah. Serial killer too. Yeah. So even more or less, yeah. <laughs> it's like 2% versus 98% or something like that like the ratio is just off but anyways so that's half of it but then what in the the, in like the specific shot that you described it's like what she's wearing is like the horror to come like you know why she's wearing that you know what she's holding like there's you don't even have to have a lot of context you're like okay she's wearing stuff to where you know she's gonna get wet like with fucking blood and she's holding a syringe you know that's in like some like torture like like thing that's gonna uh, incapacitate you but let her have her way with and do god knows i mean that image is almost like worse than like what she actually ends up doing which is ultimately she sticks him like a pin cushion and cuts off his foot well you can think of a lot worse thing i mean 
maybe not, but like some people could think of a lot worse things than that. It could have continued, right? It's yeah. like it could have gotten worse with each person. Like she might have done even more crazy shit. So like, I think it's like this promise of like, what is she going to do? And like, yeah, th- that's crazy. Like you don't have, there's nothing you can do because you're like paralyzed. That's like creepy, right? Like you literally can't move, but you feel everything. I yeah, think that's, that's like insane. in the shot of, of, of that one picture of her kind of clear. He- and um the the actor does a great job of um <laughs> expressing of, that pain expressing that pain right because he's like he can only move one hand or whatever and it's just going back and forth you're like oh fuck man um ryu ishibashi um, playing yeah. shigaharu he does a great job with that but so does uh Aihi shina playing asami i think she just she did a great job playing like a very creepy creepy character yeah i think i think the other thing that I, that as a almost like if you put her against like a slasher villain or something like this this is on another level right because like a slasher villain it's like oh i'm not stupid enough to like i'm gonna run away like i i know i have the ability to run away i can fight someone off it's like but here's the thing in this scenario like your dick got you in this scenario and you got catfished and there is nothing you could like it's a different kind of killer like we've seen the kinds of killers that like they just stab you and you die it's like no this is awful like she's gonna take her time with you and by the way she's not even gonna kill you like she's gonna gonna stick you in a bag where you're gonna live until she gets somebody else she's gonna kill you if you're lucky yeah yeah, exactly. That's right. Death is what you want at this point. Yeah. And that's so I think that's like that's the thing. And it's like kind of it's like kind of all in that picture. Like you kind of are aware of just based off of like her vibe and how she's acting and how that picture is composed and what she's holding. Like all of that is like a little bit implied uh, like, just kind of- from the cover. <laughs> It's kind of fucked that that's the cover, though, because it's kind of a twist. I mean, like, if you hadn't, if you went, I haven't seen a trailer, or if I did, it's been a long time ago. Um, so if you just went in this blind, you wouldn't, it would kind of mess it up for you. Like, you, if you just went in blind, you maybe you could ascertain that something was going to happen, but you wouldn't know exactly what. But the if you see the cover like that, you know, and you're just waiting for that. Like you said, you were just... Yeah. You knew you were just waiting for it, right? Yeah, exactly. Just kind of fucked. But but you said that his dick got him into into this. But I was thinking like it, it kind of has like themes of like loneliness and like the search for connection. Right. Because he is, yeah, maybe he's really horny, but it doesn't come off to me like that. He's really extremely horny. It's more loneliness. And and I wonder if she's doing it as well because of loneliness well i i think they both are yeah search for a connection right and that's why i say like i feel like i don't want to see this remade because all of that is so subtle and like i said he you know he he was thinking with his dick but in a movie in 2020s it would just be about that you know, it would just be like, oh, look, he's like trying to get laid and, you know, but it's like he he's genuinely searching for love. He did it in a bad way, a very bad way. Um, But it's it's the movie isn't like. Overtly like, look, he just needs to, you know, it is it is a bit sympathetic. It's sympathetic to both characters, for sure. Like it's yeah. it's not like condoning or not condoning either of their you know their actions it's like here's these two fucked up things and the outcome of it you know it's not presenting it in this way that's like trying to tell trying to like it has subtext you know it's not it's it has a nice subtext all the stuff you can read into it and it's not wearing it on its sleeve like I feel like a modern movie. You can you can read into it and you can really grab into it. And it's like, look, what he's doing is so fucked up. What she's doing is so fucked up. You know, 
But like, it's not like I feel like in a movie that was made now, this conversation that we're having would be in the film. It would be like, oh, and and you got catfished, and she would say something like that, and it's oh, like, I no, see, yeah. we don't need we don't need her to say, hey, you got catfished, and then to cut off his dick or something like that. You know, we we that got would, that. That would be totally respect fun. this. It respects its audience. I don't know if it's meaning to or not, but it it is. Yeah. So um, let's just go into let's go into our rating. So what we do here, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, being your fourth or fifth, well, that's to be determined uh, time on the show. Uh, we rate movies on an upside down cross scale. So out of five upside down crosses, how many would you give for audition? Well, the the more I think about it, the more I like it. So I think it's three and a half or four stars. Three and a half is a movie that I really like. So, you know, um, so it's it's either those two. Um, I know, I know. I was thinking like I looked at my uh, you know how my ratings on Letterboxd and I saw Cure was only rated four stars. And I think Cure is potentially better than this movie. So it's like maybe I need to move Cure up. And this gets four stars and Cure gets four and a half or five stars. So is that what you're saying? Sure. Take that with what you will. Don't edit any of this. So Zach Chapman has said that he gives Audition four stars. 3.99. No, four <laughs> stars. We don't... All right. So you, you give it four stars. Uh, for me, I, I'm right there with you. I gave it four stars um, when I when I saw it years ago. And I'm, I'm still there. I'm at four stars. I love it. It's not a perfect movie but it's a really good movie. Um, and, you know, there's not, there's not much to fault here. Perhaps like, like you said, the sound design, some of the music choices, while I see what they were going for, maybe didn't hit, they didn't hit it as much as they thought it, they were as much as they wanted to. So some of that, some of that was missed. Um, but overall really solid movie. Loved it a lot. So I give it. I mean, four, those those complaints I feel like are are products of the time it was made, in the budget that it was made, in that kind of rushed state. So it's like, yeah, you can, you know, if I take, if I look at it from that perspective, it's like okay, you have to love that too because that's what they had to work with, like a crappy MIDI keyboard. They can't they can't score this film. Like it's. It, it, they don't have an orchestra to do that. They, a they don't have the means to do that. So like they're just doing writer. their best. Yeah. You know, so. Um, it doesn't detract much from it, but, but like I said, it's not like, I, I can't give it four and a half or five stars, but it's a solid four star. Uh, nope. I can't give it four and a half or five upside down crosses, but it's a solid four upside down cross movie. I got to stay on brand here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what we've done in the past uh, is uh, I would recommend you three movies um, that you would watch and, we, you know, we'd come back, talk about it. But uh, what, something that we did last week with Anthony Jerome and something I kind of want to continue doing instead is I recommend you a movie and you recommend me a movie in a similar vein. It could be another Takashi Miki movie or it could be another psychological horror from Japan or from Asia or something like that. So just in general. What's what what movie you got for me? Yeah, so for me, I'm going to um give you so he's he's done um god damn it, what was the movie called? Okay, so he's done Itchy the Killer from 2001. Um, so I kind of want you to watch that, but there's a bad shit crazy movie that's kind of listed as his like best top three movies, and that's the happiness of the katakuris. I recommended that one to a friend of the show, Andrew Hilbert, and he loved it. So it's in that weird vein. So I kind of, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see Itchy the Killer one day, but I yeah. kind of want you to watch The Happiness of the Katakuris from 2001. I mean, I, I want to watch both of those. Those, yeah. those both sound awesome. Yeah. The Happiness of the Katakuris is a musical and you know, I hate musicals, but this is so fucking weird that it doesn't even really matter so that's what i would recommend to you the happiness of the categories from 2001 what would you recommend to me all right so i, I mentioned this like twice before uh it's a movie i watched at uh 
AFS re, uh, probably last year. It's called Cure. It's a uh, Hayoshi Kurosawa film. And uh, it's about a detective that is um, investigating these really bizarre murders. It At first, it feels a little bit like a procedural, but then it starts it starts feeling more of like a horror movie and more of like um, either psychological or um, like a, um, like a, what do they call it? Um, supernatural, potentially a supernatural thing or a science fiction thing where um, it, it like, is this killer able to manipulate people into killing themselves and other people like just by talking to them is he like a super genius like how is he how are these murders happening and it's super gruesome it starts off super gruesome uh and i'm not so sure if it sticks the landing but like that kind of like super villain murderer versus like a confused uh, narrator that might be uh, un- like an unreliable narrator uh, is it's just awesome and it's same time period I think it's like 97 so like kind of filmed right around the same time and then that guy went on to do a bunch of like really famous like ring grudge type movies okay. I think but this was like the I think the one that kind of put him on the map and in my opinion, that that might be better than those other ones. Okay, hell yeah, I haven't I I've heard of it, I haven't seen it, so definitely looking forward to to watching that. But I know we gotta get going. So, Zach, thank you once again for your either fourth or fifth <laughs> appearance on the <laughs> show. Um, if you could please let everybody know where they can follow you and how they can support you, how they can get a book, uh, how how they can purchase a copy of House of Blood. Uh, Chappy Zach on Twitter and Instagram and in my bio there's a link to the online store and I can ship it out I got a ton of copies you can also order a digital copy online and uh, yeah that's all I got thanks for having me and if you would like to follow me you can follow me on Instagram at my horror confessional at Twitter at mhcpod if you'd like to email me you can email the show at my horror confessional at gmail.com we also have a patreon where we do where i do uh, additional uh, series like uh, my 2k confessional with anthony jerome m and just i drop other other things on there so if you'd like to support the show you can support me at uh, patreon.com slash my horror confessional if you can also rate review and subscribe on your platform of choice that always helps the show thank you very much and we'll talk to you next week (laughs) 